a decade now. Oritas was founded in 2003, headquartered out of Orlando, Florida. Uh, we are the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, we uh, we have about uh, 117 employees. Um, uh, and hello, everyone. If you did not hear the webcast early on, um, and my name is Deepak Sood, and uh, I'm covering the GDPR uh, compliance uh, initiative out here, and. Um, you know, we will uh, give a quick introduction to our organization out here. So um, our core areas, three core areas where we specialize in uh, include ILM, extended ECM or ECM and HANA optimizations. And, uh, you know, we have worked over 200 different clients in this space over the, over the years out there. Now, why do we fit into this area and how do we establish our uh, need skills in, in the enterprise uh, lifecycle management space. This is how our uh, interpretation for digital transformation and data and document management come into play. As you know that you are constantly creating data, consuming, archiving, and hopefully you are doing data disposition also, although we find that the final frontier, the disposition process is not being addressed by majority of the organizations. The fear factor, the fact that, oh, I might need it in the future, um, you know, we always come into play and, and data disposition or retention compliance and governance, or there are some other terms like records management and all, are not being addressed in, in that exercise. Well, um, you know, and, and we have been, um, you know, we have been marketing, we have been talking about this idea for quite some time, um, knowing the fact that now, um, you know, you will find that data is potentially toxic after a certain uh, period of time. It becomes not a helpful agent in your organization, but it could be detrimental to your uh, future initiatives out there. But now it has taken a whole different dimension. After the GDPR compliance, what is happening is now there are penalties that are linked with keeping data beyond its retention. And that's what we're going to talk about in this webcast. But our three core areas for how we handle that kind of content includes extended ECM or ECM with open tech solution in particular. That said, if you have FileNet, if you have Documentum, if you have SAP solutions and all, we, we have certified resources in all of those areas. We do not resell any software. Our intent out here is primarily to provide quality services into the solution that you have already invested into. That includes document management, content management, records management, and accounts payable automation. Um, information lifecycle management is going to be a critical component for you to address your GDPR compliance. How does that fit into the model? I'm going to share that into the uh, as we go into the webcast, and Bill is going to provide you with the nitty-gritty details into that area. If you are moving towards the area around HANA platform, suite on HANA, S4 HANA, BW on HANA, and all, um, you know, of course, the data that you're going to store out there is going to be relevant for uh, GDPR requirements. But if you want to optimize that data from a performance and uh, from, um, you know, utilization of space and, uh, and uh, you know, reporting perspective, we have a practice that addresses the HANA optimizations. So going into the granular details of this webcast, what is GDPR? I'm going to, I have a couple of slides to cover the premise or why the GDPR is relevant and what exactly it is all about. But I am presuming for those of you who are attending this webcast, uh, you already have uh, a general idea of what it is, how did it come into play, what are the due dates for it. And um, I will also think that majority of you attending this webcast are in different stages of being compliant with this requirement. <clears throat> so. This requirement came into be in, um, you know, early on some, some years ago where uh, the European Union recognized that the information that is being captured for their <clears throat> European citizens, namely the, the PII personally, personally identifiable information, should have a life. This data, the ownership of that data does not belong to the organizations who are capturing it. The idea behind, the premise behind was the Googles and the Facebooks of the world where, you know, they're capturing the information, but, and, and they can utilize it to, 
to do additional functions, but at the same time, it was compromising certain areas of privacy and how did it come into play. So now they established this regulation where you have to abide by the requirements of right to be forgotten for a citizen. Not only uh, this requirement is within the geographical boundaries of European Union, but if you are keeping a European citizen's data outside the geographical boundaries, you are still liable, you are still responsible for uh, providing the details as well as destroying the details as per the request. You have to have a consent for capturing somebody's information um, yeah, and also um, you need to have the joint liabilities and defining processes around how you are maintaining that data. This piece comes into play with an example that if um, there is a hacking into the system or if somebody's security is compromised, well, what kind of liability does fall on the, the, the users or the record that you're keeping in the system? Where exactly does the liability lie out there? And for that, uh, GDPR has uh, pretty strict guidelines asking for the documentation detail about how you're making sure that this particular PII information is encrypted, is secure, is compromise, is, is secure against any kind of compromise. And if there is a compromise of that information, how quickly do you have to divulge that information that this kind of information or this kind of uh, details of the European Union uh, citizens have been compromised and this is the liability that comes along with that. So that's called the ban mandatory breach and notifications. We're gonna talk about the fines and the penalties in the following slide. Um, it, it comes down to, well, what happens if you don't comply? See, your compliance date is May the 25th. And you know, as of May 25th, your systems, whether they are SAP, non-SAP system, linked systems, or uh, secondary systems like BW, have to be compliant with this requirement. Well, you know, we're going to talk about in our webcast out here, the specific requirements of how it is related to um, SAP and what can you do in the uh, SAP environment to be compliant with it. But let's consider the fact or identify what exactly are the consequences of not complying with that data. $20 million or 4% of the global revenue, whichever is greater. That is the first uh, line that you see for the GDPR requirement non-compliance. For multinational firms, for really large companies, this is a pretty hefty fine. Now, does that mean that you know all the companies who are in non-compliance will be liable or will end up paying this much? Time will tell. Depends upon how stringent they are. A lot of organizations are using different law firms as their first line of defense. Many of you uh, for those of you who are attending this webcast, are also looking at, are also in the wait and see mode. Let's see how other companies respond to it. Let's see how other companies do it, and we're gonna follow trail or follow accordingly out there. So that is there. But let's look at the big picture out here. Um, investor notification. If you are a public company, or if you are a company which is you know which has a big footprint of B two C, where your value, your positioning, and, and the, the general understanding of the users is our, our reputation with the users is very important. Um, any kind of issue for non-compliance, for, uh, for GDPR penalty would, could impact adversely to your entire organization's uh, business growth plans or implementation plans of any other solutions. A greater risk to reputation as well as shared investigations across the European Union are the other pieces that come along with that. Now, I'm gonna share some more details around the fact that although we know about the, the baseline GDPR uh, um, you know, compliance requirement, you will also find that within European Union, specific countries have got additional requirements. And as you are implementing the solution, um, you have to abide by those rules if you're working in those countries. Data breach reporting laws, they are a lot more stringent than the generic GDPR laws for reporting uh, within the countries like Austria, Germany, and Netherlands. Netherlands has not only established the 4% penalty for non-compliance, but they have increased the fines from 4% to 10% of your global revenue. 
Now, that's a sizable amount, and, and they are establishing that additional fine for if you are doing business within the Netherlands. And right to be forgotten cases um, has some more specific guidelines for countries. Uh, you know, for example, Sweden and Denmark has their own specific requirements in that specific area. So what is happening further? There are countries who are trying to make sure that they are able to comply with that, that request in, in a much efficient uh, manner. Countries like Japan, countries like Canada are in the process of getting a most favored nation status, whereby they are suggesting that if they have organizations who, who are headquartered of the, their respective countries, they will abide by these GDPR requirements. And for doing that, uh, they get the most favored nation or favored nation status where they will be able to get better business with the European Union. It's a fairly large investment, fairly large area where uh, these countries, uh, you know, have a lot of business going on. And these uh, favored status can give different, uh, you know, additional benefit for the countries or companies doing business in that area. Now, all of that, all the big picture of GDPR, but you know, we in this webcast are more talking about how the GDPR is going to impact the SAP system. You will find that there are some specific areas and specific exceptions that you can, you have to look into. And, you know, many times you will say that, you know, how can I comply with that if I have to reply to, for instance, an audit request? You will have data, potential PII data or GDPR relevant data in following areas. This is generic information, but then we're gonna go granular and we're gonna go even into the technical details of the system out here, starting with personnel. You are keeeping in your ECC environment, S4, C, HANA environment with SAP HR, success factors, and also if you're using field glass, you're capturing PII related information in there. Customer related information, now customer could be an organization and customer could be an individual could be kept within your sales and distribution module, also your payments coming out of finance and controlling. CRM system, a lot of that data is sitting out there as well as hybrids. Now, another question comes about secondary data, meaning, um, you know, I am capturing data, but for reporting purpose, I have my own BW or a data warehouse platform. Is that system relevant to my compliance with SAP? Absolutely. See, GDPR does not care whether you are using your system of record as ECC or you have a legacy system running somewhere or you are doing reporting out of the BW platform. All they say is if we can identify that information as PII information, you have to make sure that if that information contains European Union citizen details, you have to comply with GDPR and it does not matter where you are. Uh, you know, uh, for for complying with that request. For example, I was doing a presentation the other day, and uh, there's a school district out of Texas, say, you know, who came in and they said that, look, we have teachers who are European citizens who are working with us, and we are looking at it on how we are going to comply with that request because we could be asked for complying with that GDPR requirement because we are keeping European citizens' data in our SAP system. So, I mean, the, the you know, can GDPR find a, a school district in, in, in Texas? Time will tell, or we do not know the answer to that. But the implications are going that far, and you have to look into it. How does it come into play? So the question comes down to, uh, you know, and, and I'm still continuing on, the, on, on this slide, it comes down to that, if I have to reply to audit, let's say, um, you know, I, I did some, uh, you know, transaction where I had a sales order and, uh, and then I received the payment from that particular customer of mine. And now that customer is saying, oh, as for the PII data, you have to dispose my information. But then you have not completed your audits. You are, you know, you have some other retention requirements and compliance requirements that you have to abide by, which what piece of information takes precedence over the other? In that area, um, GDPR has strict guidelines and defined some other guidelines whereby you can have exceptions. 
whereby you can say that, okay, we know that you are going to keep data longer than what you are supposed to keep as per the general GDPR guidelines. However, since you have compliance requirements, audit requirements, or some other legal requirements, we give you the extension based on that particular need to keep the data for extended period of time. But you have to have a proper documentation detail for keeping that information. Not only that, you have to establish how your that particular data is only kept for complying with that request, meaning no other user can access that information. And finally, when that request has been complied with, when that audit is over, how do you determine and how do you show that the moment that piece is done, you are able to dispose or destroy that information right away? All of those things need to be established within the SAP system. And we'll talk about it, how SAP is approaching that and how we are addressing that. Just some more general details. So Gardner, as you know, is a benchmark in, in, in our IT industries of establishing how companies are doing it, what are the different guidelines. So we thought we'll borrow their suggestion on how they are recommending to address this requirement. Identify a role. Create a position of data protection officer in your organization. If you look at European Union companies or companies doing business, you will find a lot of them have created this new role of data protection officer. It's a very important role. It's a very risky role too. Well, because all the liability falls on the DPO and, and, the, the, uh, and the penalties for non-compliance with that requirement could also result in jail time. So it is a very critical and very important position that companies have identified and they are actively looking for people to come, you know, to take that position and assume that responsibility and demonstrate how they are able to have accountability for processing the activities that they are doing within their system, show how the data is being shared across borders, and also define a proper auditing and documentation trail for complying with the GDPR requests. So from our perspective, what you have to do for complying with the GDPR request, number one, define roles and responsibilities within your organizations, who's going to do what. But again, you need to have the tools for doing that, and we're gonna cover that piece further into the, into the presentation. Access your readiness. Set up the processes. Deploy innovation and stay informed. So, um, you know, one of the things that I want to mention out there, for those of you who are trying or, or who are in, in a different level of complying with the, the GDPR request, you will find that some companies um, are using the fact that they have started that process of complying with GDPR request to get extensions. See, May 25th is the date for you to be complied with it, but GDPR, European Union uh, our agency, does understand that it takes a lot of effort for really large organizations to comply with that effort. As long as you are able to provide the documentation details that you have made a concerted, a dedicated effort to comply with it, you have done some blueprinting, you have, you know, you are looking at some tools and you have purchased some tools to comply with it, but it is not yet implemented, that's okay for you to get extension into complying with that requirement. So all of those things are going to help you into uh, implementing a solution that will, uh, you know, that will comply with the GDPR request. So five things from our perspective that you will need to look into, implement SAP ILM. This is a retention management tool. Bill is gonna talk more in detail about it, what exactly it is. Uh, build mining reports, audit compliance reports. And you know, ILM tool primarily is uh, you know, a tool that is uh, a level up of standard data archiving functionality in the system and how it addresses all of those needs. Uh, prepare your SWAT teams. This is the logistics of how you're gonna address. Sometimes we are being asked questions that, well, if somebody is asking for us to comply with the GDPR requirement and somebody, you know, and GDPR authority, <coughs> excuse me, from Europe, ask us to comply with the request, where is that request going to go? Which email address are they going to use? What phone number are they going to use? All of those things, you need to put a process together from your side that if we get a request, how exactly are we going to comply it and who is going to request those details? And you know, and so that's more of a logistic process decision that what you want to make uh, on addressing these requirements. Two other areas that I wanted to mention. 
primary and secondary references. See, you can say that I have my HR data and in my HR system, I'm only capturing details of my employee, first name, last name, and address. That's it, I'm not capturing anything else. But then you have maybe another HR table um, where you are keeping their bank account details, um, their routing numbers, or you might have a separate system where you are keeping that detail. Now, as per the GDPR requirement, not only your primary references are of consequence, your secondary rec reference is equally important. In other terms, if you are able to rebuild the information by joining data across tables, across different applications, and you are able to convert that into a potential PII detail, you have to make sure you showcase, you de declare what that information is and what is your process for de destroying that information. Not only that, if you have any kind of reports or procedures that will that can recreate that information, you also have to divulge that detail also in the system. So we thought we can give you an example of different areas within ECC that might contain that detail. So here are some of the areas that could potentially capture your PII details. Customer master, vendor master, logistic areas, cash journals. I'm not gonna read all of them, but you can, I think you can see there is a whole slew of area, even in the ECC system, that can capture that detail. Just to give you an example further, how are you going to address that, that detail? If you're going into the ECC system, you are now looking at the table level. You're looking at the fields. You're looking at what exactly the information is being captured for customers. And here are the examples of potential tables, KNA1, KNBK, KNVK, same thing for vendors. At that point, you start accounting for what information is being captured where, how exactly I'm going to archive slash destroy the information. Is there any process around block and delete? This, this is a new functionality from SAP whereby you can keep the data, but you block it from further access. But then once you have quantified that, you have to build a process trail of addressing that requirement. I'm gonna give you one example out here for a business partner along with contract or a delivery invoice and payment, whereby what are the potential areas and details you are capturing, and if you join all of those details, what kind of information are you, know, are you able to recreate for this particular European citizen, and how you have to make sure that you're able to dispose it. So here are some sample examples. Business partner contains name and address. Your sold to party will have the address of your order out there. Where exactly you delivered that information is your delivery address. Invoice address could be different, but these are all PII data. Last but not the least, you are keeping the bank account and the credit card details of that particular person. And all of those areas have to be addressed from archiving, deletion, and disposition perspective as per the GDPR compliance requirement. So, um, now I'm gonna pass on this info, uh, the, the microphone over to Bill and he's gonna talk about how ILM helps you with GDPR and what does ILM tool, what ILM tool is all about. Bill? Thank you, Deepak. Um, now I want to try to tie all this together as to how you can use processes and possibly software to satisfy your GDPR requirements like he just went through. So information lifecycle management is a process as well as software from SAP. So it might be a little confusing. And everyone is doing information management, but maybe not all are doing lifecycle management. I mean, cradle to grave. You can't keep everything forever. That just doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make financial or legal sense, that's for sure. So what do you do? Well, you stay, start with data archiving, which moves the data off the database but you still have access, so we haven't destroyed anything yet. I imagine not everyone on this call is SAP savvy, but I'm going to talk specifically about GDPR and how the SAP transactions and the ILM software can help you comply to regulations. The first part of information management is the data volume management, or DVM. And of course, we used to use acronyms because it's SAP, so um, this is the standard way for space reduction and improved online response time performance. This is the SARA transaction be used to store the data to cheaper media. 
especially if you're going to in-memory uh, more expensive databases. The next part is the retention management or the end of life of data. I hope everyone here has a retention policy. Um, you might have an old document-based policy and good for you if you're translated to the SAP world of tables and object-based retention rules. But if not, and you are on SAP, <clears throat> then you really need to get going because you're at risk even before May 28th. So now this moves on to the next step of data cleanup, the enforcement of the rules or policies. You can also apply these retention rules to data that was archived even before the introduction of ILM into your environment. End of life of data has been in place with ILM software since um, the 2009 ramp up. So in the 2010 area, I think it went GA, which just now is getting much more attention uh, specifically because of GDPR. And I'll talk about some licensing thing and what the SAP is doing to help you in that regard as well at the end. The reason being, you can now be forced to destroy data like Deepak said. Now that's a harsh word, you had destroy data, but it's a reality now. You have to dispose of the data. Um, before you may have been out of compliance to your corporate policy and at risk, but now you're at a greater risk for lawsuits and major fines. Certainly someone in this litigation happy world is going to challenge and they're gonna sue after 528 to see if they can get money out of corporations, maybe even settling out of court, because they know companies aren't ready to scrub their personal info off of all the platforms. But if you start, you show progress and a plan, then the courts will be much more favorable. Um, we're not lawyers, of course, so you need to check with your legal staff, but starting is the key. The next step is system decommissioning or end of life of system versus end of life of data. Like I just mentioned all platforms. Now that means like SAP databases, the backups, uh, database extractions like Dart, open text storage, uh, documents, spreadsheets, blah, blah, blah. I mean, everything you have on their personal information. So that also includes um, legacy systems and those systems that no longer used in production. Maybe you convert it to ECC or HANA or you have a 4OB old system or a 4.6B system or even an old ECC system now that you've moved on and you have an ILM central system containing all that decommissioned systems data. Or um, maybe even that fourth step of non-SAP data, structured and unstructured data. So you have data and documents and that could be anywhere. Or that could also be on the central system because the ILM software can be used to store historical data from legacy SAP or non-SAP systems. The ILM software could be your answer to how to manage the data lifecycle. The next slide is SAP, NetWeaver, ILM, and OpenText. Deepak. Okay, now this shows how it all fits together to store the data, manage the data, reduce the data, and dispose of the data for compliance and productivity. Now OpenText is a good tool set for helping in this regard. Now we don't have enough time today to get into the details of OpenText Extended ECM, but you do need software and hardware that can access the data, and it's associated documents through a web browser, and that's key or the web DAF, and stores dates. And that's important so you can allow for expiration and thus destruction. I imagine we could do another webinar uh, on this if uh, there's interest. So maybe get back to Lori or Michael Management. We can see if um, that is any interest. The next slide is the GDR compliance process. Now this uh, starts the e-discovery to identify what areas, tables, and fields are needed to find a PII. So that also includes the indirect identifiers like birth date, uh, postal code, even things um, that I just read recently about uh, photographs. Uh, I don't know how we're gonna do that. E email addresses, bank details, of course. Uh, posts on social media, now that's, that's gonna be a tough one. Um, 
medical information, of course, that's been in place, but more enforcement here with fines, and IP address. Then you have to determine now, how are we gonna tag that for possible deletion? But we still have to follow the guidelines to be compliant. You have to protect their privacy and delete on request. Can you do that? If you can, then you're way ahead of the game. The next slide is process to disposition. Uh, you may have archiving objects for all personal data or may not have archiving objects for all personal data to be deleted. And also, you might have Z fields or uh, custom tables. These would also be issues. It can be addressed, you know, write um, some more code. But even if the data has an object, it might not have the PII and the selection criteria, so it might make it hard to uh, wean it out. But ILM allows you to add fields for retention and uh, base the expiration and thus the destruction on differing dates. Um, so that's again where you can, they give you options on drop downs and then you can also code um, some changes if it's uh, unique to your company. And audit reporting is a must for defensible litigation. The uh, Department of Justice has said that uncontrolled and unmonitored data deletion is not acceptable. You need to be able to show, one, a policy exists for retention, two, you are enforcing the policy, Three, you can report who implemented, when, what, where, and why. And four, you must have the ability to override or hold the data for outstanding litigation. Now, can't, companies can't do all that if not using software to help enforce the data management. You can't just have uh, basis folks whacking data with no audit trail. On the next slide, shows us the ILM class at Michael Management. We created a short 35 minute course to help educate on the use of uh, this ILM software. If you're interested in seeing ILM live, there's a link here to the course and, and there's an email address of uh, David here at uh, Michael Management that can uh, set that up for you. Now we didn't have time today um, to demo the ILM screens and procedures, but again, it could be an option for something future down the road. Now, the next slide is the overview of the ILM course. Um, in this class, you'll learn setting up the data retention using your corporate policies. You'll see data hitting those expiration dates and how it's destroyed unless, of course, it's under legal hold. And also how to set up a hold on data if it is litigation relevant. We show how ILM and open text work together, the risks and costs of data management, and GDR adds a huge amount of new risk for data management. The audience is, uh, it's a lot of people here now, the retention managers, uh, compliance officers, now the new data protection officer that was just mentioned, uh, the legal team, basis team, uh, CIOs, or really anyone dealing with GDPR or system performance or even hardware footprint reduction, like if you're preparing for um, in-memory in a HANA database or S4. So all in all, you'd have less data, less risk, hardware cost savings, improved online response times, Reduced e-discovery costs, which you can run in multi-millions of dollars. I've seen that many times. And you can be a superhero. This is where you ask, where do I sign up? Or, or maybe you're saying, sure, sounds good, but at what cost? Well, be assured it's less than a court battle or multi-million dollar fines. As I mentioned before, but this is worth repeating, um, the Supreme Court has ruled that it is permissible to delete data but only under specific circumstances. And to quote their, um, what they had said in the uh, document was, any automatic system to purge is fine, as long as there's a way to turn it off. So you aren't destroying documents, you have an obligation to preserve. And what you want to be able to say, and this is what the lawyers say, we cannot produce what we do not possess. 
and that's really key. Also, as to the SAP software ILM costs, as of January 2nd, uh, 2018 of this year, SAP announced the license-free solution for your SAP system for GDPR. SAP, SAP has enhanced SAP NetWeaver runtime license with retention management functions from ILM, making this specific function license-free for SAP customers. And even they went beyond that. They said compensation is planned. Now, so I don't know where they're going with this, but for SAP clients who have already bought ILM to use for the GDPR project. But you need to check with your SAP rep, of course, for that um, details. But that is really, really good news. Uh, ILM um, was a very uh, expensive uh, license to run the retention management and the retention warehouse those two different licenses, and now they're breaking pieces apart to help with GDPR in the SAP world because they know they have so many customers that have to abide by these regulations. So now Deepak will summarize, uh, tell you how you can start, and then QA. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deepak, back to you. Thank you, Bill. So now that you know the SAP's ILM tool and being offered free of cost for complying with GDPR, um, if you have an open text tool already, that'll be great. If you do not, uh, I can, we can provide you with the details of that. However, uh, you know, if, if you are uh, another shop having Documentum or FileNet or for that matter using SAP IQ or Hadoop, there are multiple ops for doing that. Please connect with us and we can provide you with details on that. We have also built a, a, a blueprint as well as a process uh, approach of how to address this piece. What is it that you need to do in the SAP system? What would be a total approach around it? What are the roles and responsibilities of a person or a group of people who are going to address your data protection requirements? You know, starting with the data protection officer in your company, and also what would be the process you're going to follow from start to finish to address with the request, complying with the request, and eventual disposition of this information. This is all covered as part of our offerings, um, you know, from services to solutions to a unique area expertise. If you need any kind of demo for our solution, we'll be happy to provide that detail to you also. Please let us know and we can provide that information over to you. I am now going to request Laurie to ask, uh, to share um, any of the questions that attendees have asked and I'll try to answer that to the best of my knowledge. Great, thank you. So we have the first question. We are a small company of 150 employees. Are we subject to, to the GDPR requirements as well? There is a guideline where you have a number, a minimum number based on which you have to comply with that request. The request. However, when it comes to the PII request compliance, Please keep it in mind, even if you are a small company, you still have to comply with those requests in, uh, in the organization. And our next question is, with GDPR's enforcement date so close, what can I do now to avoid getting fined? One thing that I mentioned um, as an example, you can start with establishing a process a small engagement that will quantify your exercise uh, and intend to show to GDPR organization that you are doing some work. You are going, moving forward with that complying initiative. You need more time, will help you um, avoid immediate um, audit as well as penalties coming from GDPR. Is the UK still a part of this after they've left the European Union? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Okay, it looks like we have one last question. Can you tell me about your D GDPR assessment and how someone could get one? Well, our GDPR assessment starts with identifying what kind of data you have. Uh, you know, it's, it identifies the different areas. Uh, and again, we, we, we qualify or we collect that information both for data within the SAP ERP system
Hi, uh, Lori, can you hear me? Yes, there you are. You're back. Okay, sorry. I do not know why I got disconnected. But um, so you will find that there are uh, different complying requests. We have an approach with, um, you know, an initial kickoff where we will quantify all the different kind of data that you have in your environment, which is GDPR relevant and which is not. And we will share the tools that you can use within SAP ERP and even for documents to comply with that. I like to establish out here that we we will help you comply with that request, but can we certify you to be GDPR compliant? We cannot. That responsibility still falls on the shoulder of the legal representation you have that will help you establish that. All right, I think that's it. And thank you so much everyone for attending today. And please know that everyone who registered and attended today will receive a complete copy of the slide deck and all of the contact information so that you can reach out with any additional questions that you have. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you for attending today. Thank you, bye-bye.